Hi students. So today we are going to talk about uh, some uh, additional packages in R. This is the beginning of uh, three lectures on, or three videos on some additional packages that I would say are very popular in modern R. Uh, or at least one of them is, or two of them. I, I'm not so sure about the Magritte package, but I'm a big fan of it myself. So we're going to talk about these packages. Uh, these packages form uh, co uh, our core packages of this uh, package ecosystem known as the tidyverse amongst our users, which are packages that are bringing a different perspective on how R itself should be functioning. In many ways, these packages are uh, they're they're doing many things that base R would do, but in a way that the creators of these packages believe is better and more robust. So we're going to see some of these packages and some of their ideas and why they exist. Now, uh, I mention these because very often, if you continue to work with R, you're probably going to encounter these packages and you're probably going to encounter users of these packages. Uh, I myself will sometimes use these packages, but I am not a diehard fan like some other R users. Not that they're bad, it's just... I don't think they are the end-all be-all of our work. So, uh, but I do want to talk about them, so we will. Uh, so be aware that none of these packages are installed with, uh, with R by default. You're going to have to install all of these packages uh, in order to be able to work. So uh, the first package we're going to talk about is the Magritte package. Uh, so to motivate this package, Let's suppose that you have a long list of tasks you want to perform on a data set. For example, you want to take a data set, subset it, fit a linear model to it, and then get the coefficients. There's a few ways you can do this. One way to do this is in one ginormous function call. Oops. Uh, you could do this in one big function call, uh, like so. Uh, so we could uh, run this code, and this will, in fact, do all those steps. Uh, where you basically have functions being called on the output of other functions and yeah it could it could potentially be thorny to read uh, another way we could do this is basically do all of those steps but on their own line saving results in objects and then calling those objects in later uh, function calls uh, now these are okay okay but well maybe not maybe they're not okay the first method where you just have one giant function call that that's the problem with that is that you have a function call that's very difficult to read and someone who's trying to understand what your code is doing has to read it very carefully and remember that whenever we talk about someone who has to read your code that includes you or future you someone who isn't at this moment writing this code so Making sure that your own code is readable, understandable, and easy to modify matters. Uh, so that's one potential problem with uh, these methods. And this method right here, it's it's somewhat better, but you're also creating a bunch of named objects. You're kind of polluting the namespace in a, in a sense, where there's this notion of namespace, the things that you have named in an active session. And you're just creating all these named objects that you need to keep track of. Uh, there is... Uh, so the Magritte package was created to provide a third option, which is known as the pipe operator. And the pipe operator is this operator, percentage signed, uh, right arrow, percentage sign. So the logic is simple, where, or however you want to consider simple. You can take an object X and then pipe it to a function F to, and that what that basically does is cause the function F to be evaluated uh, on x so thus x becomes the first argument to this function f so if your function takes multiple arguments you could pipe x to f uh with the, and have give it the argument y and this will be equivalent to calling the function f of x y uh and you could now that by default the pipe operator is making the object that you are piping the first object in the fun that the function in the function call, uh, so the first argument of that function call. That's what happens by default. If you want to make it the second arg argument, you can 
uh, use dot to indicate where this argument should go. So for example, this line right here, uh, y piped into fx dot is equivalent to calling f of x on f x y. Uh, you can also use uh, this dot to list out uh, named arguments. So like for example, y piped to x foo equals dot is the same thing as f of x foo equals y. Uh, now, it you may be wondering, this just seems like extra complication, but actually when I first saw the McGritter package, I was a, I was a, a fairly regular R user. When I first saw the McGritter package and saw the pipe operator and how it could be used, my mind was blown. Uh, I, as a an R user, an active R user, was like, I will never view R the same way again after seeing the pipe operator. Because those uh, lines of code above can now be written uh, this can now be written in a way that's very easy to, to understand so what this highlighted section of code means is we take the iris data set and then we subset that data set according to some subsetting rule and then fit a linear model to the subset to the subset data set notice the uh, uh, argument uh, data equals dot that's basically saying you need to put the data right here and then we get the coefficients. So we end up with this pipeline that to me at very least makes so much more sense. And you can pretty much read this off as a recipe for what we want to do with the data set. So given this data set, subset it, fit a linear model, get the coefficients. Exactly what we said before. So it's like super readable. So once you understand how these uh, uh, pipe operators work. So if we were to run this code, take iris, subset it, fit a linear model, and then get the coefficients, we end up with the same results as we had up above. Uh, and you can even read your um, operation from left to right. And if you wanted to add additional operations in this pipeline, it's easy to do so. Uh, so for example, let's say I wanted to scale the data set. Uh, where, I, where I'm standardizing the variables by subtracting out their mean and dividing by the standard deviation. This is something that uh, statisticians will often want to do with uh, data sets. Uh, so make sure that data sets have mean zero and standard deviation one. It's not too hard to do. Take the iris data set, subset it, scale it, convert the scale data set to a data frame because scale returns a matrix by default. Uh, fit a linear model, get the coefficients. There we go. We now have, we're now done. And it's, so you can see that we can take that pipeline that we had before, and if we wanted to make changes to our procedure, it's very easy to do uh, when we are working with a pipeline. If we were to unwrap that code, this is, this is the resulting code. This is what the same procedure looks like without using pipes, which requires much more careful reading. So by far to me, at, um, let's see, it's unhappy about something. I, I, I guess I just copied this wrong. Um, uh, for me, at the very least, the biggest advantage of Dippler is, uh, or McGritter and the pipes, uh, is readability and uh, flexibility and the ability to make changes to your code. Uh, when you're doing a number of operations on like a data set or something, which is very often something that I, as an R user, have to do. I have to do multiple things to a data set. Uh, so there are other operators in McGritter other than the pipe operator. For example, there's this uh, almost double pipe operator where in addition to feeding the results to a function, you also save those results in the variable on the left. So this is like an inline change. Uh, to demonstrate this, I have three uh, versions of the Rivers data set. Uh, let's suppose I wanted to get the mean of the rivers data set. I could do rivers one is the mean of rivers one via assignment. And that's the usual way to do things. It's fine, except what if I wanted to, uh, well, well, first off, it's not using pipes and I've decided that I want to use pipes. So in the second example, I can just throw in a pipe, but what if I wanted to change the name of this object from rivers two to rivers three, uh, in this line of code, I would have to change both this instance and this instance of the object's name. But I can save myself some typing and make my code somewhat more robust by just using this double pipe operator. 
and notice that all of these objects are exactly the same that all of these evaluate to the same number so these are all equivalent commands but i would say that the last command is the most readable and most maintainable all right so that's uh, one additional pipe operator another pi pipe operator is the t pipe which if you've ever worked with uh actual pipes like in plumbing the idea of a t pipe is that you're now branching off um your flow of uh, whatever your liquid is uh, so that it's now going in two different directions. And that's kind of the idea of the T pipe operator where you're uh, taking this flow of data through pipes and making a temporary or making a quick detour so that you can do something with the data set as it currently is without affecting the later pipeline. So uh, here's an example where I want to uh, let's see. Um, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna promote this. Here's an example where I want to uh, do some operations on the Iris data set, but in addition to those operations, I want to make plots of the data set. So I first do the subsetting operation, but before I continue on, I want to make a plot of the sepal length versus the sepal width. So notice that there is um, at the very end uh, the a call to the pipe operator. So that means that we can now run this uh, call to plot without affecting anything that comes after this pipe. So the results of plot will actually not be what's passed to this pipe, but actually the subset of data set is going to be what appear is, is what's going to be passed. So I could then run this uh, to make a temporary plot of the data set. We're not going to see it quite yet. Then I scale the data set, make it a data frame, and notice that I have an additional T pipe right here. Uh, because I am now going to do an additional detour where I plot now the scale data set. Then I fit a linear model and then I get the coefficients. And now, in addition to having the coefficients, you'll see the coefficients in the uh, window, oops, the window on the right, or, or the left, sorry. You'll see the coefficients on the, in the window on the left. You'll also see in the plot, uh, the plots that we created along the way. And now we set this back to our old uh, graphic settings. And uh, the last pipe operator I want to talk about is the dollar pipe, uh, which works like the normal pipe, but also exposes the names of the objects on the left-hand side to the operators on the right-hand side. So basically, if you have like a data frame or a list and you want to work with the stuff that's in that data frame, the columns in the data frame, without using dollar sign notation all over the place, um, which is something that you would be doing if you were using the with function, you can use this dollar sign pipe operator to uh, to do that. So uh, x dollar pipe f of z is equivalent to doing with uh, calling with x z pipe to f, uh, which is the equivalent to with x f of z. So this can help uh, make your code easier and simpler to understand as well. All of these procedures. They may initially look intimidating, but they do, in fact, try to make writing code easier. So in this case, what I want to do is take the Iris data set, subset it, scale it, convert it to a data frame. Now we're using the dollar pipe so that we can write now LM sepal length tilde sepal width, and then I don't have to write data equals dot because implicitly we have with this data set that's been produced so far. Uh, so fit the linear model and then get the coefficients. And this is the, so, and we end up with something that looks very nice. Here is an equivalent ugly one line uh, uh, command that's much more difficult to read. And you can learn more about the McGritter and the pipe operator here. Here's a vignette that you can read uh, at this link. You can also look at the lecture notes on the webpage to get this link where you can learn more about how McGritter and the pipe operator work. Okay, so that concludes this video and I will see you in the next one where uh, we're going to be talking about Dippler, which uses the pipe operator for uh, working, at, for subsetting data sets, basically. It provides a bunch of functions that provide an alternative subsetting scheme for data sets. Okay, so I will see you in the next video.